just about to do now. So we're now recording. Um, so yeah, so the, the DESI project arises from that um, strategic uh, goal. And what we've been doing is working directly with institutions um, to kind of support well-planned, well-structured institutional adoption of, of effective data usage. Just to give a quick plug as well, um, for those of you who may not be aware, uh, we've developed Orla, our online resource for learning analytics, uh, which is an online suite of resources, guides, case studies, um, dealing with kind of most of the aspects that, that we would expect that people are kind of dealing with at the moment. Um, GDPR, accessing data, data quality, effective interventions, communications, case studies for how um, existing lecturers are currently using their data to, to drive their teaching or to support their teaching. So that's the first URL there is the link directly to Orla. And the second one, in, in a, a, a manner of getting your feet wet before you jump in the pool, you may want to go to, that's an insight that we published recently, which outlines the main steps for developing an effective strategy and links directly to some of the resources in Orla that are there to kind of support each step. Um, so again, So again, I'd like to kind of particularly thank our speakers uh, for making the, the time today and for, for providing uh, content of that's so uh, interesting and engaging at this point. It would have been, as you can already tell, it would have been a very long hour if you've just been sitting and listening to me. Um, so I'll go through kind of each of the speakers kind of more, more detail in turn before the presentations, but I, I'd really like to thank uh, Linda, Cormac, and Diane and the team for their, their, their leadership today and for their, their presentations. So, Without further ado, to kind of give you all a chance to um, uh, contribute, sorry, I see we're having kind of uh, audio problems here. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll kind of get them, get them ironed out. Um, we'll, one of the, 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 as I mentioned earlier, one of the kind of drivers behind today is really to give people the chance to, to collaborate and to talk um, so I would particularly, with regard to this question, what challenges are you currently facing? I'd ask people maybe to use the, the um, chat room. Sorry, I know we're having audio problems there. Um, we'll see what we can do again, as I say, to iron them out. Um, but, okay, yeah, I know. I'll try turning off the video and see if that helps. See you later. Um, so I don't know, is that any better for people? Um, we'll just wait and see, are people having more, more luck with that? Can you mute oh, yourself? Good. Okay, excuse me for a second. I'm going to try that and see if that works better. Okay, so is that, in terms of the sound, is that any better now? Uh, we've, we've swapped over mics. Okay, great. Okay, fantastic, excellent. Okay, thank you very much, sorry about that. Um, so for this section, we were just hoping, we're just going to take a few minutes, um, and we'd ask you to use the chat section, just to say in a few words, kind of what's, what's happening for you at the moment with regard to data usage. Either you personally, let's say, in a, a teaching capacity or within your institution, what are the sorts of challenges that you're facing at the moment? Just to see kind of what's happening and where, where everyone, where the crossovers are. So are you having difficulties accessing data or, or figuring out what to do with the data, data that you have? Um, and for those of you who haven't enabled it yet, you see there's a, a chat box down in the bottom. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, so currently you're not using data, lots of data, who analyzes it, what to do with it. Yeah, 
integrating multiple data sources. So is it fair to say that at this point, of course, yeah, find time and resources, getting access, bright space, resources, yeah. Staff unaware of what to do with the data. Oh, sorry. Um, so there seems to be, yeah, a lot of, of, there seems to be a recognition generally for the amount of data that there is, but really being able to either get the institutional culture or the um, ability or the time and resources to really know um, kind of how to maximize the value of it. Is that a fair, a fair statement? That's kind of what's happening for people? Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So, I mean, it's very interesting to see we've, we've a, a real range of institutions and of institution types and of individuals here today. So it, I think it's really interesting how similar the kind of challenges we're facing are. And I, I personally, I would take that as a very good sign as well. If we're all having the same, it means that the, the, we can all do together to get through it. So at this point, I will thank you very, very much. It's fantastic to have that. Um, and thank you all for your contributions. So at this point, I'll introduce our first speaker, um, who is Linda Hanna uh, for the University of Essex. I first heard Linda presenting at DigiFest in uh, Birmingham uh, in March, I think it was. And I was really struck under, under Linda's uh, kind of guidance, Essex have taken, and I mean, I know Linda will probably correct me on any of this, but Essex have taken a very structured and carefully thought out approach and one that has involved kind of culture development and very much the kind of thing that we have endorsed as part of the DESI project. So I'll pass over control now to Linda. So you're Linda, charge, you're in charge now. Uh, is your sound on there, Linda? Sorry, Linda, we can't hear, or certainly I can't hear you there. That should work. <laughs> Can everyone hear me now? Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, okay. Thank yeah, you, Roger. It just seemed to have taken a couple of seconds to, to do what it was supposed to do. Um, Fantastic. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Okay, so I'm just going to do a, a very quick run through, um, talk a bit about our project, which as Lee said, has been, probably ended up being a bit bigger than even we thought it was going to be, even though we did plan for it to be a, a four phase project over four academic years. So we knew it was going to be big, but I think it's turned out to be more than we thought. Um, the first slide you're seeing here has got the name of our dashboard system that we've created, which is called the Learner Engagement Activity Portal. Um, and one of the things to point out on this is we talk a lot about learning analytics. Here at Essex, we talk about learner analytics, and that's because we wanted it to be very student-centered. So at this point, it was much less about the bigger data, if you like, in terms of management information. It was much more about how do we support our students. So it was deliberate that we call, about learner, we call it learner analytics. So if I try and move on, yeah, there we go. Um, so what have we actually done? We've introduced some student dashboards. So now staff and students see academic activity data. That's things like usage of our VLE, we use Moodle. Um, how often they use our online coursework submission platform, how often they use our lecture capture system. Um, we've also got attendance monitoring, so how often people have tapped into events. Um, all of that's put together and weighted and given an engagement score. So these student dashboards are out there now and they're being used across the whole university. So that's around 14,500 students uh, using it. Um, we've created an ethical use of data policy. So some of the, the comments that I'm saying about GDPR, we spent a long time thinking about and talking about GDPR. Um, and it eventually culminated in this ethical use of data policy that makes sure that, as far as we are concerned, we're compliant with GDPR and we're being very open and transparent about the data that we use and how we use it. We've created new ways of working. So this is very much a cultural change project with a technical element 
to it rather than the other way around. And certainly over here, um, the universities that I've talked to in mostly Scotland, England, some in Wales, um, have come at it from a technical point of view, some of them. So it's the IT people who are leading on it. But actually, it's much more about the cultural change. So the, the new ways of working for staff, very much so. But also, we're trying to help students understand a lot of data that they didn't have access to before. Um, and one of the most important things we did was to listen and respond to our staff and to our students, although it's a lot harder to get students to, to talk to you. Um, but we listened to the staff. So the timeline on the project, as I said, this is a four phase project. We had the first phase in 2016-17. That setup phase was recruiting a project team. We already decided we would have a dedicated project team. So there's me as a senior project manager and we also have a business analyst and we had a project support officer at that point. Um, since then, we've also gained a data analyst um, and a graduate intern as well. And as we've needed staff, we've had a budget for the four years, and as we've needed staff, we've, we've got staff. The setup phase also included going out to the market and looking at what was out there in terms of software, deciding whether to build something in house, whether to use JISC's um, learning analytics solution, or whether to, to use one of the commercial suppliers which is where our business analyst came in very handy. And in the end, we decided to go with Solution Path and their stream software. And the reason that it ended up being Solution Path, although they didn't have everything that we wanted, they had a good student interface. And we had already decided right at the start of our project that students must see everything that staff see. That transparency was really important. It was pretty much only this, the only solution that delivered that for us. So we signed up with them for a year initially, and we've just signed up last year for another two years with them. Um, so that was quite a lot of work to get to that, to the point where we had a working dashboard, which then in phase two in the next year we could pilot. We piloted with three of our departments, about 900 students, um, I think around 70 or 80 members of staff. We did that for a whole year. We had business school students, we had lit English literature students, and we had biological science students, and we had different year groups, so we thought that would be quite a good test. The pilot went well, um, and so we decided for the next phase, we would roll it out to the whole university, but it wasn't a business as usual situation. We realized there was still a lot to do with the system. Um, so we called it rollout and development. We made it voluntary. We said we told our 18 departments they could choose to use it or not. Um, all 18 did choose to use it. So we've actually had the whole university using the, the system this year. And then next year, it's transitioned to business as usual. So we've started work this year on identifying the new business owners of the system and the new technical owners of the system and starting to transfer some of the responsibilities to them. So some of the some things around governance and future vision and whatever we're, we're talking to them is going to provide. So that's a four year timeline. That, so let's show there was a lot of thinking went into it and I think that's been really useful and being able to develop it in this iterative sort of way so that we've learned from one phase and we've used that in the next phase. That's been very useful. This is a new approach for um, certainly most of the staff in the university. We've put a lot of new data in front of them. This is just some examples. Um, some of these are from the, the stream software and the, the dashboards that we show. Um, the one on the bottom left hand side is a Tableau report that we've created. So along with the software and what it gives us, we've also created a suite of Tableau reports that give our staff a bit more management information, but also individual student information at a level of detail that not that the software just couldn't provide us with. So this is the kind of thing that we're now asking people to look at that they didn't ever have to look at before. Not only to look at it, but to interpret it, understand what it means, and then take some action. So this cultural change idea, um, that's where this comes in. We're now asking staff to do things they didn't do before, and, and do things in a different way and we have to help them understand what they're seeing and what to do with it. So we've had to build some policy, we've had to build some guidelines, procedures, good practice around, okay, when you see a certain pattern of behaviour with a student, do you do anything? And if you do something, what is that thing that you do? So you've got a whole lot around interventions, our personal tutoring policy, our attendance policies, all of these policies have been influenced and changed by what we've done here. 
But one of the crucial things that we did was to start with some big decisions. So we started right, right at the very beginning to say this is about supporting students. We came from a point which I think a lot of people come from, which is we have to do something about continuation and degree outcomes. So we started there and we thought about predictive analytics and we thought about um, how we could try and find the people who needed more help. But we thought it was quite important to state up front that this is about supporting students because we did get concern from staff that it would be used to monitor them and their performance. So we had to say quite quickly, no, it's not about that. Um, it is a cultural change project. It's much more, it's much wider than just implementing a bit of technology. We decided it needed a dedicated project team. I think from our point of view, that was a very good decision because not only can we deal with the technical side of things, but this wider policy, Information, sorry, my screen just changed and I don't know why. Um, not only um, deal with policy, and um, we could deal with things like GDPR and we could talk to them all about people. Um, so the, there were a lot of questions that came up um, from staff and from mostly from staff, actually, students didn't turn a hair about getting all of this information, about having all of this stuff looked at. Um, Staff wanted to know how well I found the time was this extra work. It wasn't extra work. It was actually making their life easier because they had more information about the students. And um, they could get information much more quickly in the one place that they used to have to go on the place to find. They worried about what students would think. They worried if it was ethical. So we had to spend a lot of time on transparency and on making sure everyone understood that whatever staff saw students would see too. They've questioned the models that we're using to calculate engagement and we're doing some work with Solution Path this year and with Nottingham Trent University who use the same software to try out different models, perhaps for different cohorts or different types of courses. Um, once people got used to it and liked what it did, they asked us a thousand questions about can it do more things. Um, we've had to be quite firm and manage um, people's expectations and, and not have too much scope creep coming into this because it could do a lot of things but it's not going to in the short term because we have to get it right first. People want to talk about what good engagement looks like so we give people an engagement score and then someone has to look at that and think about is that what we expected. Um, that's challenged our departments quite a lot because they've had to think about what engagement they expect. What exactly do they expect students to do in terms of the VLE and in terms of lecture capture and work and other things. And so some of the work we'll do next year is around this, around departments thinking about engagement. Everybody wants to know what's the impact. So even though we've only had it in the whole university for a couple of terms, everybody wants benefits realization and impact and whatever. And I think I say it's too soon every day, at least once a day. Um, people want to use it too, so people like the Students Union are coming to us and saying, well, can we put our data in there as well, can we track this? We've had to again say no because a lot of the decisions were made early on that this was about academic activities only. Um, and then the name, I mean, Learner Engagement Activity Portal, it was, it was agony getting the name, but it did matter and we've just um, surveyed some students and find we've got a really, really high level of recognition of our icon and our name. So that's quite pleasing. It was quite a painful experience to get the name in the first place. But it's something for people to latch on to that they can talk about. So we're now known as the LEAP team, even though our project is actually called Supporting Student Success Through Learner Analytics. We're now the LEAP team. Um, let's see if we can change this. What we've learned then is academic staff, staff do see the benefits of having this information at their fingertips, sharing it with the students. And one of the key things in our software is that people can make notes of meetings with students um, and share them with the students. Um, you have to be a bit careful, obviously, about what you write because it's all transparent, but that's been really beneficial. You don't have lots of emails and follow up emails because it's all just there in the system. Um, students need to have useful information in there to make it useful for them to use it. So we've been working hard on getting marks, current year marks, into our system because along with attendance information and a couple of other things, that's what we find students are interested in looking at. 
some students are much more engaged than others. The ones we get telephone calls from, or sorry, not telephone calls, we have a, an inbox. Um, the queries are from the students who've got 99% attendance and think they should have 100 um, rather than from the, the less engaged ones, so that's a challenge. Um, digital skills are very important when you're approaching something like this, but I could use the interface is by far the most important thing. Because if it's easy, if it's like any other website or any other interface that you navigate your way around, then people will use it. And we've had no trouble with training people. They don't need training actually because it's so intuitive to move around it and that helps a lot. So the, the skills that people need are not digital skills, they're skills around understanding engagement, thinking about engagement and interpreting what they're seeing and then knowing what to do after that. Um, a, a collaborative approach which is around, um, lost my, I've lost my slide again, a collaborative approach with our academics works um, and we found that we have had a lot of collaboration, we have had a lot of um, cooperation with academic staff and with students and with the students' unions, so we haven't had any problem with that at all. I'm afraid I can't get back to my previous slides, so... Oh, thank you. Oh, two, two very quick things then. Everyone will challenge the data. The data is very hard to get in the first place, um, and then everybody will say it's wrong. So the data is a massive challenge, and good communication is absolutely critical, which I'm sure everybody knows, but we've spent a lot of time working on a communications plan and delivering that and checking that as well, using every communication channel at our disposal. Okay, I'll finish there, because I don't want to talk for too long. So I've got some contact details on there if people want them. Um, I'll hand back to Lee, <laughs> control. That's perfect. Thank you very, very much, Linda. Can, can you hear me right? Yes, I can. Keep, I can Fantastic. <clears throat> excuse me. Sorry for the, the, the gremlins. Excuse me. No, it's uh, okay. I, just thought, you were moving, I, just, I just thought you were moving me only. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we need a little, a, a virtual crook. No, not at all. They, they down to sheer digital incompetence, nothing else. Um, so I'm, I'm sure the people, no doubt, have an awful lot of questions for you. Uh, I see we have one question has already come in through the Q&A section. Um, so from James, how was the weighting decided for VLE interactions, lecture capture interactions, attendance? What was the criteria for giving higher and lower weightings? Um, we didn't decide on that. That was done via a machine learning exercise. So with Solution Path, the first step with them is this thing they call the foundation report, where they have a year's worth of data and the data that they had from us, I see there's a question about attendance and marks. So the, the other things that we have in, we don't have marks in the model. We have in the model um, attendance data, we have um, VLE data, so that's logins to Moodle, but also accesses to course materials on Moodle. So there's a couple of bits in there. We have um, use of our university PCs, so logging into university PCs, but not personal devices. Um, we have use of our lecture capture system as well, which is an in-house development system. So we have a few things in there. We gave a year's worth of data to Solution Path, um, who ran, did some machine learning stuff, which sort of spewed out the model with the weightings. And that was fine. That was fine for the pilot, and that was fine for the first year. But now we've got lots of people coming back and saying, oh, oh our department's different. We need... Um, a different weighting. So we're going to run that sort of process again with subsets of the data. I think there's an exercise that we're going to take part in this year to see what that does to the model. So we're trying to, to trying to make the model work, not something that we decide on through intuition or whatever, but something that's based on data because it seems like the most reasonable way to do it. Um, I see there's a question on recording attendance. We have got some readers and people tap in. They've got cards and they tap in and I can't remember the name of the company that provides those readers but there's technical people if anyone who's interested that I can put them in touch with. So they tap in and all of that data goes into, we have a data warehouse so I suppose that's another important thing which is the data warehouse has made it so much easier to do this because then we can get data out a bit more easily. So all of that goes into the data warehouse and then goes out into the software um, which is housed on our servers here. Um, question on 
disability and socioeconomic status. We don't have any of that in our system. That was another of our early decisions was that this is purely about academic activities once you are our student. So there's nothing in there about previous attainment. It's kind of day one situation. You come here and, and you're treated the same way. We have had a lot of pressure to put in that kind of special category data, but partly from, from a GDPR point of view and partly also from a not biasing anything point of view, we haven't put that in, so we made a decision not to do that. We could, um, we have thought that at some point, once we've got lots of engagement data, we might do some anonymized analysis around that to help inform other decisions, but no, not in the dashboard as it is. There's very little personal data in there, the, the absolute minimum personal data in there. Thank you very much. A few more questions there. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, I know we have a few more questions there, but we might just push on for now. Yeah, if, nobody yeah. wants. And if, if, if people want to contact me, then that's, that's great. Just do it directly. Uh, thank you very much, Linda. I really appreciate it. Uh, so we might just push on. As I say, if we have a bit more time at the end, we may come back. Um, so I'll pass over to Cormac. Oh, no, hang on, sorry. I'll pass over to Cormac in just a second. So sorry, Cormac, you should have control there. Um, so I was down with uh, Cormac in March, I think, um, over in Galway. And what's really, really exciting about the approach that himself and Attain are doing, and I, this is something that's very, very dear to me, is the fact that they're using ordinary available software to really do incredible things. And I think there's an awful lot to be said for that approach, rather than starting out by investing 100 grand in a, a platform that's all bells and whistles. I think the, the approach that Gormick and Etain are taking to really drive um, proper student feedback, you know, effective pedagogy using ordinary tools um, is really, really striking. So Cormac, I'll pass over to you. Perfect. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Is my sound okay? Yeah, absolutely. Can everyone hear? Great. Um, and do I have control? Yes, I do. Okay, perfect. Um, hi, everyone. So myself and Atain are down GMIT, and we've been working at harnessing student data for personalized feedback, or at least that's how the project started. So the initial aim of the project, um, we'll get on to who the students are in a little bit, was to take the data that we have and give the students an overview of their own performance. So you can see on the slide there, there's a few templates of different uh, feedback sheets that we've given to the students. But the basic idea behind it was that we'd be able to give each student a snapshot overview of everything they're doing because the data exists there. So all we have to do is transform it. Um, but to give you a bit of background, there's about 300 students in first year who do chemistry and there's about 500 students who do maths. So there's an awful lot of students. And as a result, there's an awful lot of information about those students. There's 10 different lecturers deliver labs. The lab happens 20 times a week and they're in groups of 16. And that group of 16 could contain any of 10 entry or maybe 12 different entry routes going on to eight different courses ultimately. So it's quite a diverse set of students. Um, so there's a lot of different bits of data and it kind of lends itself to, well, you know, if we set them up to do, what are we asking them to do? Is it working? So it was all about feedback, and I've skipped on one slide too many here. I'm half in control of these slides. But to give you some idea of where this information comes from, in a typical week, what do we ask of our first years? So in the case of chemistry, they're asked to watch a pre-lab video, then they're asked to do a quiz, then they're asked to do the lab itself, then they're asked maybe to watch another uh, video on the calculations, then they do another quiz on the calculations of their own lab work, and then maybe we give them some feedback. And that's just one week and they've got four, they're doing physics, chemistry, maths and biology. So they have quite a bit going on in a given week. And so the questions that start to arise are, well, you know, what can we do with all that information? And also, is that a fair thing to ask of the students? So this is our typical workflow. And if you put it together, by the time the students get to week six, you know, they've gone through all of these different uh, tests pass fail and usually or as it was they just get some summative information and what we wanted to do was make that holistic and um, give them all of the information so that they can make informed decisions so that's where the analytics part of this comes in it's you start to wonder like what can analytics offer you and analytics uh, as Lee was saying at the start of this all of this is done uh, through Excel 
Um, it's done through Microsoft Word. And I have occasionally strayed out into Minitab, but that's not a necessary thing. Uh, it can all be done through Excel. But if you think about our first year module, an individual first year student might have 50 data points per term, just solely in terms of assessment and attendance. They do 20 quizzes, 12 labs, some theory CAs, a lab exam, um, attendance at the different labs, maybe tutorials. So it's 50 points per module per term. Nothing to do with how they're engaging, just have they completed the necessary uh, items. And so it's hard for the first years to keep track of what they're doing. And it's also hard for the lecturers to keep track of what, of what the students are doing. Because if you think about the lecturer situation, either you're in a lecturing room with 200 students or you're in a lab with 16 students, but you don't know anything about what else they've been doing. So that was what motivated this. The other part of it is that the feedback thing is kind of two ways, because you can try, um, as Linda was saying, you can try and get feedback from students, but they don't necessarily tell you anything. Sometimes they don't respond at all. And when they do tell you things, it's through a very particular lens. So the analytics kind of provide an insight into how the students are behaving and what the workload looks like. And so that's the first thing that I wanted to have a look at is when you start thinking, well, are we over assessing them? You can look at how they behave in relation to the quizzes. You can set up analytics like this. So here we have over, over one term, how many days before the deadline did the students do the post lab quiz? And you can see that that's almost a random distribution of how many days before the deadline did they actually do the exercise. And what I've taken that to mean, and what I think is a fair interpretation of that, is that the deadline doesn't matter as to when they do the work. They just do the work as it comes up. And so it's become a weekly thing, it's part of their routine, and so they're not stressed out by it. So I don't think in this sense we're overtaxing our students or overassessing our students. But then you start to see something interesting. There's two high stakes quizzes on Moodle, one each term, and you get a very different behavior. You get this almost exponential growth. So you can see on the right-hand side there, it took the last six days as you get closer to the deadline. And you can see that the number of students working at it grows exponentially, i.e. the students are procrastinating. So if the students are procrastinating, that's a fair sign that the way that they view that work is different to the way they view their weekly assignment. So if you set a large assignment, you're going to cause stress. And if you set a smaller assignment, you're not. And these are just the things, the little bits of information that you can get back from doing your analytics. Other things that have been really useful are, you know, we can assess the results that they actually get. So in Moodle, we get them to put in their actual lab results and we grade those. And what it means is that we can look at the lab and we can identify, you know, 22% of the students aren't getting within the expected 10% of the expected value. And we're asking them to measure a physical constant. So we know that they should get the right answer. But then you can see different distributions. So there's a good number of students who are within 2% of the right value, but significantly off. And then there's lots of students who are, you know, it's normally distributed uh, around the correct value as well. And so that tells the lecturer that, you know, there's different things going on in the class. And so the analytics are really useful. But getting back to how this project started was creating feedback from lecturer to student. So if you use Moodle, if you use any VLA, VLE, you'll know that there is a good data set behind every um, set of student interactions. You can download the grades, everything else you might want. And what we did from there then was we set out criteria. So we set out, you can see in the grid here, you know, what is the kind of feedback you'd want to give a student who falls in each particular criteria. And then all you have to do in Excel is set up, so the statement that's written there is an if statement. And all it's doing is relating the grid here uh, above the if statement to a particular grade obtained by a student. And so you can edit that and you can say whatever particular feedback is appropriate to whatever particular grade. And you can make it as simple or as complex as you want. And then you can set it out into a mail merge and then you can create the feedback sheet. And what's really nice about that is that all of that is contained within the Microsoft environment. So in terms of, you know, people talk about things like GDPR and data safety, all of that is contained or can be contained within uh, the online environment. You don't have to take anything outside your uh, established environment. There's no interacting with other third parties. And so in that sense, it's really quite safe. In terms of looking at the feedback, it becomes truly personalized and it becomes really useful. You know, if there's nine different feedback zones, that's two million possible outputs. So students aren't getting the same feedback and it gives them actionable changes, which really, you know, from their perspective, when we look at their feedback, which we'll look at now, it starts to change the way that they behave. And you can see, you can look back in that. There's a few different examples of ways you can set them up or you know, giving them things that they can aim for or asking them why they didn't do different things. But when it comes to the feedback from the students, surveying the students, so 161 students responded and 94% of them said that they found 
the feedback sheets that they were giving out or that we were giving out useful. And then 72% of those said that it actually changed how they were studying. So it changed their approach to studying chemistry or maths. Um, and it gave them uh, a sense of how they were doing. It improved their confidence and it reduced their anxiety. So it's, you know, there are single statements from single students um, and we don't have the data to make statistically significant claims, but it's certainly pointing to something that if we were to look further into this, it's definitely benefiting the students. From a lecturer point of view, it's really useful uh, for the lecturers who in the lab to be able to assess a student, okay, maybe the student has missed two or three labs. Are they missing a lot of things across the course or was it just two or three labs? And then from a department perspective, you can send that further up the chain. And when heads of school or heads of department are dealing with problem students, they can look at how those students are doing. The feedback is generally targeted for high attrition times of the year. So we're all the time trying to boost retention. Okay, that's just about in the time slot. So thanks very much. Thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, I'll try and answer them. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much, Cormac. <clears throat> Excuse me. As, as ever, I think it's such an interesting presentation. I've no doubt there'll be a, a, a good number of questions on it. Can I just maybe get the ball rolling and ask how, you know, to, to what extent um, do you, it, would the, a user require like a very high level of competency, say, with Excel and Word to enable this? To enable the so, feedback? Um, I've actually, because we ran a seminar there uh, back in March and there is, a, there is a learning curve. It's definitely not, if you're not familiar with, um, Excel at all, you know, there, there is definitely a learning curve, but it's something that if you put the time into, like it becomes uh, possible. And one of the things about it is that once you have set up the if statements, say, or you've set up the categories, you don't have to go redoing that. You just do that once and then you modify it for each different case. So mm -hmm. there is a learning curve, but uh, once you get, um, once you get it going, it, it's up and running, you know? And I think it's time well invested because you know, okay, it took me a few days to get it going the first time, but now it's a few hours to take the data and create feedback for, say, 300 students. So, Fantastic. Thank you very much. If you want to, to stick on your, your video there as well, it's up to yourself. Oh, yeah. Sure. Um, so, sorry. So, we have another... Do you love playing with uh, trial and error with the if statements in Excel? Um, it's... Um, so, I mean, in terms of playing with the if statements, once you have it set up once... Uh, how I have it, have I, how I have it done is that the if statement will just categorize things, and then I can edit the comment sheet, so I can change the comments and I can change the categories. So I don't actually have to go tinkering with that if statement. Once I have it written for, you know, if I say there's four or five or six categories, then I can just edit the categories away from the statement, which makes it a lot easier to use. Because if you try editing the if statement with the text in there or anything like that, it just it very quickly gets out of hand. Perfect. Uh, I, Sorry. I can see some of the questions coming up. Uh, we actually print out the feedback and give it uh, in the labs. So each of the lectures is given 16 sheets and they'll hand it out on a one-to-one -one basis to the student. And that's probably one of the really valuable parts because then the, stu the student is eyeballed by the lecturer and the lecturer says, I know how you're doing. Do you have any questions about this? Um, and actually, like Linda was saying, you often get questions, oh, I attended, you know, I'm down for 95% attendance, but it should be 98. You know, so he, you catch errors in that sense too. Um, and sorry then, just the, the, the time before the due date, how it's affected by other modules. Um, so for the, no, uh, I haven't, but for the, um, for the non, for the low stakes assessment, uh, what you're looking at is um, several thousand attempts across 12 different weeks of term from all of the cohorts who are not necessarily doing the same other modules. So mm -hmm. it's, I would imagine uh, the effect of other modules is, limited. Um, in terms of the what's available for the high stakes one, um, I would have to look at, because I don't have that uh, work in front of me now, but I think at the time I checked that the timetable was clear, like it wasn't that they were doing other things and didn't have the time to do it. Fantastic. Well, listen, thank you very, very much again. I think it's really, really interesting work that you're doing. And I, I think there are an awful lot of applications to, to a, a lot of other institutions and a lot of other staff who teach out there. So Great. thank you very, very much again. Yeah, I mean, we're happy to collaborate. So I mean, if people want to get in touch, I know I didn't put my email address on there, um, but if people want to get in touch, they can, and we'll, you know, we're happy to talk. So thanks. I, I expect this may become a full-time gig for you. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very, very much, Cormac. Thanks. Um, so, sorry, we'll just take it back and we'll pass over.
So sorry, I'm just going to move on. Uh, so I'll pass you over to Diane and Neve who now have control. And I think that the, what's really interesting here is the, the, the institutional approach and the, the support of senior management that this project has had. Um, as I said, the, the, the theme here is what works. And I think having that kind of institutional drive seems to have been such an important part um, to kind of successful initiatives. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to, to hearing more about what uh, Diane and Eve at UCD have, have learned from their approach. So I'll pass over to you guys, thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name, name is Steve Nestor. I'm the student advisor at the School of Veterinary Medicine in UCD, and I'm here with my colleague, Diane Cashman, who's the lecturer of veterinary education in the school. Um, we work together uh, with uh, pro uh, Professor Jason Last, who is the sponsor of our project. Um, also on our project team is Associate Professor Sue Rackard from the School of Veterinary Medicine, Ashley O'Grady, who's the head of the student advisory service, and we work work collaboratively as well with UCD IT services and UCD buildings and services. Uh, for the presentation, uh, we're just going to talk about the background to the project and the aim, uh, what worked, and then our key recommendations uh, for future phases of the project. Uh, so we're just going to go on to talk about the project itself. So the aim of our project, um, which ran as a pilot project in the School of Veterinary Medicine in UCD this year, uh, the aim of it uh, is twofold. Um, the first aim was to offer early support interventions to students who may be disengaging from the pro uh, from uh, for, uh, disengaging from the program, um, as evidenced by a decrease in their attendance. So this was a, the metric that we focused on throughout the project. And the second aim was to offer students the opportunity to look at their own attendance data as well. Um, it's important to note that at the School of Veterinary Medicine, we don't really have a retention issue. So if students start to disengage, um, there, this is usually for other reasons and what we found is that this includes um, maybe some emotional difficulties or mental health difficulties that are coming up for the students. Um, uh, there, there are high levels of anxiety and depression well documented in research on veterinary students and the veterinary profession more generally. Um, so a typical example of what was happening was that if a student had disengaged from the program, this usually became apparent around exam time. We run exams twice a year in UCD um, at Christmas and in May. So uh, a student may have failed a module or a collation of their attendance data happened at the end of the semester and it became apparent that the student might have disengaged a little earlier in the semester and this might have led to some difficulties for the student. So we wanted to develop a mechanism to intervene early earlier in this process uh, in order to try to offer support to students at an earlier point. Um, and our tool of choice was to use learning analytics. So after much planning and discussing uh, and reviewing of the literature, we began our pilot project uh, in September 2018, and it's just concluded at the end of April 2019. Uh, there were 70 undergraduate uh, first year veterinary students involved in the project. Uh, we collected attendance over their 10, 10 of their core modules. They also have two elective modules. We didn't include those in the project and we collected attendance data across two semesters. How it works is that the student at the beginning of the year, so in September, downloads an app to their phone. Um, they, when they enter a classroom where they're, they're timetable to be in that classroom at that time, um, they, their phone picks up a Bluetooth, on a Bluetooth beacon that's in the room and they log their attendance through the mobile phone app. Uh, the students see what we see, so whatever attendance data we receive, the student also receives that attendance data so they can monitor their own attendance. Um, we then, uh, during the, pro the project, um, uh, the student advisor, which is myself, we offered early support interventions. So the way it worked is that if a student missed more than two classes in a week, uh, the following Monday they received an email, an automatic email, but signed off by the student advisor offering support and just noting that uh, they had missed more than two classes in the previous week. So if there were after three further recurrences of this pattern, um, it, this, it culminated in an invitation to the student to meet the student advisor, and then we would discuss any 
any necessary supports that the student um, that the student might need. Uh, so finally, just before I hand over to Diane, I just want to mention the how we evaluated the project. So we conducted a survey on attitudes to attendance, both in semesters one and two. And in semester two, we also surveyed how the students found the technology itself and using it. And we um, also ran some focus groups as well to get further feedback from students. So I'm just going to hand over to Diane. She's going to talk about what worked and key recommendations. Thanks, Neve. Um, yes, yeah, so overall, really what we found is um, implementing the piece of technology, I suppose, with any technological um, new step that we'd like to intervene in, in, a, in a school has some initial setup challenges. So we work very closely with, with our software provider to overcome those. So what we ended up, thankfully, with was a system that um, was located in 10 venues across our, our um, campus here in UCD that students could sign into. And... The, the information successfully did collate into a central repository and from there myself and he were able to see the trends of students engagement with that so technologically it, it worked which was, which was great for the few one or two little hiccups at the start um, we'd have to say as well student feedback for, to us is that they were, they were actually a very engaged cohort they're very enthusiastic and very willing to give this a go and try it out and um, support this initiative, which was, which was really great and very really positive from, from, from our perspective as well. And the module coordinator supports very positive towards this pro, pro, um, project. Really, what, what we were able to do through this attendance data is, as Neve had mentioned, she was able to go in and see what, what the trends were happening with students. The system automated out, as we mentioned, these automatic emails which accumulated um, into a, a, an invitation for a meeting. And um, we wouldn't have had visibility about that previously, really. Um, historically, we would have, uh, say, paper-based um, attendance collation at mandatory practicals, for example. But the visibility of that data is never shared. It's, it's pretty much held with the module coordinator. So it's great to have it centralised. The student advisor has that uh, quick and ready access. So students themselves, they, they, they very appreciate the, the, the benefits of coming to, coming to class and, and really what that can offer them. And in terms of the technology and getting the most bang for their buck, I suppose, out of that, what they were reporting to us is that if the data isn't as accurate as it can be, that can be a, a demotivating for them and they can disengage with the utility of, of, of the app itself. So really, another component part as well, they said, there's motivation from their peers. If everybody was tracking their attendance, that was quite a, a strong motivational um, uh, component for them as well. So, um, so overall, um, I suppose it, we were happy we, for, for a pilot. It, it implemented, we, it, it functioned as it should have done, and students were very positive towards it. And um, with a few um, outcomes in terms of dissemination going forward uh, across other conferences. And uh, also a lot of um, people expressing an interest in, in this particular system and the mechanism that we were putting in place. Um, I suppose just quickly to wrap up our key recommendations, we're, we're, we are going uh, ahead again now next year and taking a lot of the lessons from our first iteration and moving them forward. So really one of our key principles is to ensure that whatever data we have and we're collecting, that that is as accurate as possible. And this is, as I mentioned, it would be a strong motivator for students to engage and to find good benefits from actually this, this system themselves as, as well as our own. If the data is wrong, we're going to unfortunately target students, uh, not the correct students. So really, whatever interventions we can, in uh, strategies we can implement at a school level, um, we're very keen to try and make that as efficient as possible. For example, if you see on my slide there in point D, um, as with every other program, classes move left and right quite quickly sometimes. Timetables can change from the status quo of week one, semester one. So about having mechanisms to making sure that a student uh, is tagging data, their attendance, uh, at the correct location and you know, these are things we can address locally as well um, and also as well I suppose any technological issues um, we had a, I suppose a three to four week delay at the start um, we, we want to overcome it's really important that barrier of technologies is overcome quickly and we ensure that that keeps going so I suppose just to summarize I hand back to me if yeah okay thanks Diane so just to uh, finish up uh, we applied for funding to continue with the project under the um, 2018 innovation and transformation program from the HEA and we were jointly awarded um, with some funding uh, together with DCU as that collaborative project has is, has started and is moving forward now um, our own project 
here in the school as part of that will scale up uh, to several programs and several groups in the UCD School of Veterinary Medicine this September. So we started with one group, one cohort uh, last September and we're moving forward now to include four groups this coming September and then in September 2020 we're looking to scale up further to several schools in UCD. Thank you very much. Much more ready to go on. Yeah, let's take some questions. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much, guys. It's really, really interesting. Uh, so I see we, we have questions jumping in here already. Again, we only have a little bit of time left, so we might just take a, a handful of questions, maybe if, if people want to get into contact with you directly afterwards. Would that be all right? Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so what, what were the teething issues? Yeah, well, I suppose, uh, when I take the technology yeah. one, so it's the easy ones to start off with. We, we just had a, a single sign-on authentication issue. It was a two-step approach um, with a pin, and our mobile providers uh, had a few blocks. Completely uh, unknown until we got going, um, but um, we removed the two-step authentication, went down to a single sign-on using their password and username that they would be familiar with here in UCD. Once that was dealt with, we were fine. Yeah. It, was, it was fine then. Yeah. 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 So that, from a technological perspective, that's the only thing. I would say as well, from a minor perspective, I had to do a bit of tweaking. We have these beacons on the wall. I probably should grab one and show you. Yeah. Um, beacons on the wall. I just had to adjust some of the settings on that. But uh, um, overall, that was okay. Yeah. yeah. And then sometimes, like Diane had mentioned, it wasn't really a teething issue, but if, if a class had been moved, so the, the not being able to update the timetable in real time, so that would cause a couple of issues. And, yeah. and like Diane had mentioned as well, if the data was in any way inaccurate, and so if the student received an automated email offering support, but the student felt, and I, I think Linda had mentioned this as well as part of her presentation, that they had attended everything. And like Linda said, it was interesting, uh, it would be students who had very good attendance who would be saying, no, I was, I was present for everything. And and, you know you're telling me I missed a couple of classes so yeah it's just kind of working through those things with students as well. It's very interesting how that's a recurrent theme across all three presentations and sorry we might just take this then as the last one from John and um, any key advice on the, the hardware and app side um, if anyone else is looking at iBeacons? Yeah yeah I suppose uh, one thing that we learned um, after this year was about location um, so, for example, we have some venues where there's a health and safety concern, mobile phones are not allowed, uh, and so students would be obviously, uh, they were reluctant, of course, uh, they've been told off not to be bringing phones in, and so it was one of those things we just didn't account for. A swipe card would have been an appropriate tool for those types of venues. And the other thing to say as well is that if a student is scheduled, say, two slots concurrently, one after the other, um, it's very easy to forget about tagging in or checking in for the second uh, class. Simple um, kind of cultural user type issues, usability type issues. Yeah. But um, I suppose as well is trying to find that technology that's easy to use, quick to implement, and um, has scalability to it. And, and again, we, we talked about GD Core previous as well. What kind of permission levels can be provided to different levels of individuals who require different access? For example, um, you know, you know, I shouldn't be seeing you know certain data that me as a student advisor can see. How can the system restrict that access? And and so on. So it's looking for things like that when you go to have a look around at, 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 at um, services. And as well, the one benefit about the one we chose was being able to see those dashboards. We've seen lovely visuals from our um, previous uh, keynotes. Um, it's about visualizing that data so you can actually make these quick assessments. Uh, otherwise, sometimes being met with loads of spreadsheets can be quite hard to yeah. process. So um, what kind of visualizations can they offer with your analytics is also very handy. Fantastic, thank you very much. Crystal, I see we have a, problem, a question there for me as well. I'm afraid we might, might skip on if you don't mind. I'm really sorry, but could I ask you to make contact directly with Neve and Diane? Uh, because there's just one other piece. I want to get you all out in time to get a sandwich before you go back. And there's just one other piece. We just want to have a quick, just show you quickly. So one of the things um, that we've done, as I say, like a right, well, I think two of the things that we've seen today are that individuals and institutions across the country are coming across a lot of the same issues kind of both with where we are and with where we're trying to get. And I think from, from the work that we can see going on in, in with Linda and with Cormac and with Neve and Diane, is that there are very innovative, very effective solutions out there as well. And I think one thing I've really been struck by over the course of this project is the, the willingness and in fact active desire 
for institutions and for individuals across the country to work together. So with that in mind, we set up this Padlet. Um, I know Padlet has its, 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 its potential drawbacks as a tool, but just for, for this purpose, essentially as a notice board. So we'd encourage you very strongly, either now and kind of into the future, my, my hope is that this will persist as a, as a, as a, as a resource. That if, if you're having questions, if you're having challenges, come into the, the Padlet page. So you can see the URL is there. You should see the, the little uh, pink circle down at the bottom. Um, so if you just click that, you'll be, thank you very much, Gorak, my, my uh, beautiful assistant. Um, so you, you should be able to see that, be able to post um, questions that you're having or issues that you're having, or even you know, things that have worked out well for you. Um, and be sure if you're asking a question or, or posting anything, please be sure to put your email address because I, I'll keep an eye on it myself. I've kind of I've been very fortunate to meet a lot of people around the sector, so I've, I've some idea of who can help kind of who with what. But I would encourage you to put your email address in it so that other people can find you. And to those who maybe don't have questions, um, I, I'd strongly suggest going in anyway because there things will come up that you can answer. And I would encourage everyone to go into it. I know a lot of people will think the stuff that I've done isn't really that relevant or isn't really that important. And that's been so far from my experience. Everyone that I've seen, every, every kind of institution that I've been to, there is stuff going on that would be really, really helpful to other people that they often underestimate the value of. Um, so please do, excuse me, this, this will be as successful as we can make it. Um, and I mean, otherwise, really, that's it. I'd like to say a very big thank you uh, to Catherine and to Colin uh, for, for uh, making sure I didn't have a heart attack halfway through this and for, for passing my, my, my stroke medication intravenously. Um, I'd like to say an enormous thank you to our speakers, um, Linda, Cormac, Neve, and Diane. I think you will all agree that we got really, really, I'm about to sound like Donald Trump. We got really, really excellent. We got the best speakers. Um, that I, I think the presentations that we had were perfect. And I think that's reflected very much in the attendance and the participation that we had today. I don't know whether you guys can see it, but we've had kind of teetering around 55 people um, involved throughout the whole thing. Uh, so thank you all very, very, very much. And finally, thanks to you guys for participating and for taking part. It would have been awfully lonesome here with AG. Um, so I'll sign out now and please, I'd strongly encourage you, please do keep an eye on the Padlet. As you know, we've been recording this um, and, and we'll send out, make access, the, the recording accessible after the fact. Now go and get your ice creams or your carrot juices or mojitos or whatever floats your boat of a sunny Tuesday. Thank you very, very Thanks, much. Thanks, everyone. Slong Bye. Bye.